Good evening. Um, I can't um, start tonight without saying um, it is the it is an incredible joy to be here uh, uh, preaching the word. Those of who you, those of you who know me personally uh, know that nothing excites me in my life more uh, more than being in the word and preaching the word. I I've been involved with a lot of events and a lot of different things over the years, but. My favorite thing is to be uh, preaching from the Word because what I've, what I've discovered is that there's power in the Word. And in today's church world, we often rely on many times emotional experiences or music or other things, but it is the Word that changes lives. And, and, it, and it excites me. But also, I, um, I also want to say, um, this is, uh, I've, I've been in this church since uh, since. Uh, since I married Nissi and since I, uh, in a sense, married uh, into a Hebron family. But I want to say on behalf of myself and Nissi, we are really grateful for all the support you have shown us, um, especially from the wedding and, and all the stuff before that. And the way you have blessed us and, and prayed for us, we're really grateful for that. Um, as I look around this room, I see so many faces, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just very surreal to be, to be here tonight because I've literally would not be here today if, if it were not for many of the people in this room. But I'm especially grateful today to be with my wife's parents and to be able to worship with my wife's parents and my wife's uh, family and also um, other relatives and stuff that I, uh, and people that are here. But especially, I, want to, I really thank uh, Jitu and Joe. You guys have really been inspirational in my life and you guys have touched me in many ways. And so, um, so I'm very excited to be here, uh, though I serve on the pastoral team, and I attend a different church in the city. I consider everybody here very close friends and family, uh, and I, I look forward to every time I come to this church and visit here. I want to uh, go into the scripture and uh, something that I believe in very, in very, in very strongly is the importance of the word. So can we? And and and, um, and I know from that, I know that this is a scripture that you have been meditating on very deeply in this last week over the Zoom sessions and over last night with Pastor Danny. I actually spoke with Pastor Danny after yesterday as well, and I know that you have really been meditating on this. But for the reading of the word, can I, can I ask you all to stand with me as I read the word tonight? You all know the scripture, but I just believe in the power of giving importance to the word tonight. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray over this word. Father God, I just thank you that this is your living word, and we thank you that it is your word that is um, ministering tonight. And I pray, God, that, Lord, the words that I speak tonight are led by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that the word comes straight from the Spirit tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to st start tonight. We, um, this is a scripture that I have read many, many times. And when... when uh, when I was told this was the scripture, I was really excited. This is one of my favorite verses, and I always, you know, quote this verse. It's very, uh, it's a very quotable and memorable verse. It's particularly the part about uh, being a living sacrifice and holy and acceptable to the Lord. But recently, I was kind of reading this, and I was like, and I was thinking about what is something that stands out to me, and it's a word that many, uh, most of the time, we actually just kind of, uh, just our eyes kind of glaze over. But it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, or in view of the mercies of God, to present your bodies. And I was, was really fascinated by the, the idea of the word present. Um, many of you know, especially if you follow the news in the last several months, that the Queen of England, uh, former Queen of England, recently passed away, and now we have a new King of England. And what's interesting is, I, I've, I've always had an obsession with um, British royalty, just kind of how it works, why people, why, why they're so, 
there's so many particular customs and traditions tied to British royalty. Why do you act a certain way? And I was reading um, about the 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 process and I was, uh, of of being around the Queen. And I was reading a particular piece where the Queen of England uh, at one time was in Canada, and she was going down some uh, like a staircase or something, and the governor of Canada or a main leader was standing next to the queen, and the, and and, and uh, as being being an older uh, person and like and and not in the best condition, she was, she almost fell, and so in in light of that, the the governor of Canada reached out and like helped her stand up, and then everybody had and there was all this confusion in the air because. They're like, well, she's the queen. Was that the right thing to do? Is that the, is that the way to is that the way to act around the queen? I mean, the queen's supposed to lead. You can't just you know you can't just touch the queen like that. That's not the right thing to do. And then I was looking into the etiquette and the rules, and it's really kind of fascinating when I was looking at this. Um, if you are gonna if you're gonna officially greet the queen or king, you have to curtsy or you have to bow with your head only. You cannot shake hands. You can't do a combination of anything. You have to curtsy in a very professional manner. You have to use the right greeting. I, I can't just go up to, like, if I went to uh, uh, any one of my friends here and just, uh, and just said hello, I'd probably shake their hand, give them a hug, and say hello. I can't do that to the queen or the king because they are royalty. They have a certain presence about them. Um, you have to be early. You can, never, you can never arrive at an event after a royal person has arrived. You have to take the royal person's lead. So if I'm standing near the king or the queen, I can't talk to them unless they talk to me. I cannot say, hi, queen. Like, that doesn't work, right? The queen has to say, talk to me. Or, you know, like, talk to me and say, like, has to greet me in some fashion or manner. Um, all this to say, it's interesting, this idea of, of presenting. And which leads me to uh, the, the, uh, a scripture that I wanted to read and just talking about this idea of royalty, actually, in Esther chapter 5. In Esther, we, we know Esther is a woman who um, was used by God to, uh, to protect the Jewish people. And she went through a difficult time when she knew that the Jews were going to be persecuted and attacked. And she was told by Mordecai, I need you to fast for three days, and then I need you to go before the king and petition, and do and 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 advocate, and do and do what you can for your people. And I love what I was reading. This it says in chapter five, verse one to three. It says, on the third day after fasting, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne, inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. Now, what stood out to me about this was the posture of Esther. Esther was in the correct posture to be accepted by the king. The king was willing to grant Esther an audience because she was in the right posture. So going back to the idea of the word present, Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, as, as uh, Joe was mentioning before, it's an all-encompassing presentation. And I love the verse, uh, there's another scripture that Paul says in Second T uh, Timothy 2, verse 15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. And I was thinking about this. It says, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. 
The opposite of ashamed is to be full of shame. And in today's world, what is it that, what is it that brings us shame? Shame, for a definition's sake, is the painful emotion that is caused by a consciousness or awareness of guilt, failure, impropriety, that often results in this paralyzing conviction that one is worthless, of no value to others or to God, unacceptable, and altogether deserving of disdain and rejection. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us walk around with the weight of shame around us. You know, you've, we, we've heard there's this idea of walking free from chains. The Bible talks about breaking chains of bondage. And what that always makes me think of is that many of us, as we go through our lives, we build up these chains of bondage that really just weigh on us. And we walk around everywhere we go with this chain around us telling us that we're not, that we're not worthy, that we're guilty, that we're not good enough. But Paul's urge to Timothy is to do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, familiar verses, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And I urge you tonight, and I will remind you tonight, if you are walking in shame, if there's any bit of shame inside you, inside of you that tells you that you are not worthy of the love of God, I remind you tonight that God looks at you and accepts you and he loves you tonight. In our community especially, I believe that shame is something that we don't talk about. We hide it. We put it on appearance. We, we look right. We have the right outfit. We come to the service. We play the part. We say hello, and we leave the church, and we're, everything is great. But the reality is many of us are wallowing in holes of self-pity. And I urge you tonight, just to remind you tonight, that you are loved and you are accepted by God tonight. So, coming back to my main, my point tonight is, I want to share a quick story and then go into, go into my main, my, my main points tonight. I have four points that I want to, uh, that I really want to um, hit at tonight. Um, in 1987, um, there was an, IR, an IRA bomb that went off in Belfast, and in that bombing, 11 people died, 63 were wounded. There was a man named Gordon Wilson. He was a, a cloth merchant and a devout Methodist. And he was buried with his 20-year-old daughter under five feet of concrete and brick. And his daughter, Marie, her last words were, Daddy, I love you very much. From his hospital bed, Wilson, Gordon Wilson, he said, I have lost my daughter, but I bear no grudge. Bitter talk is not going to bring my daughter back. I shall pray every night that God will forgive them. He lost his daughter and had every reason to be angry at so many people, so many th reasons, but he said, I have no reason to do that. Bitter talk is not going to bring her back. And he said, once he was recovered, he crusaded for reconciliation. Protestant extremists who had planned to avenge the bombing decided because of the publicity that such behavior would be politically foolish. And he wrote a book about his daughter, spoke out against violence, and he constantly said this. He said, love is the bottom line. He met with the IRA. The IRA killed his daughter. This man met with the IRA, personally forgave them, and he asked them to lay down their arms. He said, you've lost loved ones just like me. Surely enough blood has been spilled. And when he died in 1995, all of Ireland and Britain were honored this ordinary citizen for his uncommon forgiveness. The, word, my, the title of my message tonight is Uncommon. What I've really observed in society lately is that being a Christ follower, standing up for the things of Christ, 
more and more is uncommon. Forgiving when someone has hurt you is uncommon. Being peaceful when possible is uncommon. Fighting back with words on different platforms or in person in different ways, that's more common. But to show restraint and to say, I forgive you to the person who offended you, that is uncommon. And so my message tonight, I have four things I really want to highlight, but I want to talk about four aspects of of an uncommon walk that we are called to. Because, and I want to start, I want to read a few scriptures before I go there. Um, It says in 1 John 2, 2 verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So recently I've had this thought, which is, When people observe my life or your life, can they say that I am a person who loves the Lord or am I a person who loves the world? And the harsh truth about the gospel is the gospel requires a hatred of this world. Let me repeat that. The gospel, following the gospel, requires a true hatred of this world. But if you look at most of our lives, we embrace much of what this world has to offer. Look at the words that we use on a regular basis. Look at the comments that we make on a regular basis. Look at the jokes that we might laugh at on a regular basis. What is the difference? What's the differing mark between us and and the world. What is the difference? Take a look at your life in the last week. In the last week, what did you say? What did you do at your work, in your school, in the settings that God has placed you in? If if a casual third-party person were to look at you, would they say, man, that person is in love with the Lord. That person is in love with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit. The Bible talks about people in the Word that are led by the Spirit. And I I love when when writers of the Bible specifically mention people say, oh, this man was full of the Holy Spirit. Can we say that about you and me? Are we full of the Holy Spirit? And so I want to, before I say these four things, I want to talk, I want to urge you and remind you that to, to be a Christ follower involves an intentional hatred of this world. Four things. Number one is an uncommon love. And a lot of times we hear the word love, and when you study the word love in the Bible, there's different types of love. But I'm talking about this idea of agape love. John 13, 34, 35, it says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So I ask you this question. Do you have love for one another? Do you have agape love, the love of the Father that looks at a person despite anything that they may have said or done and says, I love you, I love you like my son, I love you like my daughter? And there's a story that greatly illustrates this that really has um, really provoked me and reminded me and showed me the power of this. There's a book called Hidden in Plain Sight, and the pastor named Mark Buchanan wrote about a woman. This woman's name was Regine. Her name is spelled R-E-G-I-N-E. She's originally from the country of of Rwanda. She came to Christ uh, while reading her sister's Bible during the genocide that ravaged her country. It's the genocide that's happening and, and uh, really re- messing up the country and, and messing up the lives of so many people. But she read the Bible and she accepted, the, she accepted Jesus Christ. 
She fled to Canada for refuge. She met her husband, a man named Gordon. And they decided to return after that to the country of Rwanda to show the love of Christ to the people of Rwanda, to the people who once were her enemies. And this is what um, was so profound. Um, so Regine told, this woman told the writer of this book this story. He said, a woman's only son was killed. She was consumed with grief and hate and bitterness. She prayed, God, would you reveal the killer of my son? And one night she dreamed that she was going to heaven, but there was a complication. In order to get to heaven, she had to pass through a certain house. She had to walk down the street, enter the house through the front door, go through every room up the stairs and exit through the back door of the house. And in this dream, and it, that, that was the dream that she had, and she asked God, she said, whose house is this? And God told her, this is the house of your son's killer. The road to heaven passed to the house of her enemy. Two nights later after this dream, there was a knock at her door. She opened the door and there stood a young man. This young man was about her son's age. She says, yes. The young man hesitated and then he said, I am the one who killed your son. Since that day, I have had no life, no peace. So I'm here today. I am placing my life in your hands. Kill me. I'm dead already. Throw me in jail. I'm in prison already. Torture me. I'm in torment already. Do with me as you wish to the mother of the slain son. The woman, as we know, she prayed for this day. She said, God, would you reveal the killer of my son? Now the day had arrived and she did not know what to do. She found within her something shocking. She didn't want to kill him or throw him in jail or torture him. In that moment of reckoning, she found she had only wanted one thing, a son. She said, I ask so the woman who lost her son said to the killer of her son, I ask this of you, come into my home, live with me, eat the food that I would have prepared for my son, wear the clothes I would have made for my son, become the son I lost. And so he did. That is agape love. Agape love does what God himself has done, making sons and daughters out of bitter enemies, feeding and clothing them, blazing a trail to heaven. If we are to live an uncommon life today, it involves an uncommon love. It involves an uncommon sense of connecting with, every, with other people, even people that you may not agree with even people you may have a history with, even if someone who has offended you 10, 20, 30 years ago, it, it involves a love that says, I don't care what you have done against me, I will look at you with the love of Christ. Number one is an uncommon love. Number two is an uncommon integrity. First Peter chapter three, verse 15 to 16, he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame." Today, integrity is one of the biggest lacking features among people. I think many would agree today. And I want to read, there's a, we all know the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. But I was reading it, and I want, and I, and I want to read to you uh, verse, Genesis 39, verses 11 to 23, 
Because I was, as I was rereading this story, it just provoked me to, and it showed me how good our God is. It says in verse, Genesis 39, verse 11, But one day when he, he went into the house to do his work, and, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by, by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted my voice and I cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him and said to him, This is the way your, your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him, put him, put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. So all these things happen to Joseph. Joseph is, is accused. Joseph is put in this compromising situation. He stands up with integrity. And the, and, but the beautiful thing is, I love this verse in verse 29, I'm sorry, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. I read this to say, integrity, if you hold on to it, will lead you to great places in life. Doing the right thing when no one's watching, doing the right thing when it doesn't, when, when, you, when, you are, when there's no obligation to do the right thing. In today's time, um, it's like we live in a time, I really believe, where we always look for a way out of situations. How many of you, when you're driving down the road and, you, and you're just driving down, all of a sudden you see the, a, po a police uh, light light up behind you, what is your first reaction? Slow down. But then they really want you to pull over. And as soon as you're going to pull over, like... At least for me, I mean, I don't know if anyone else, but I, I want to get out of this ticket as much as I can, right? Because I'm worried about my insurance. I'm worried about other reasons and things that, can, that are going you know, to uh, hurt me down the line. I'm worried about this, right? But, and in, but integrity says no matter what the situation is, you do the right thing. There's a story, that, a real quick story that I want to share. Pol uh, uh, there's a police chief um, from Wisconsin. He, uh, he, one time he was um, driving out there, and he... And he recognize that as a policeman, he swore an oath to keep the laws of the land. And in doing that, he wrote himself a ticket. He's out there driving, and he was going out to, he was, I think he, he, said, he said, I'm going too fast, I'm going to write myself a ticket. How many of you, let's be honest, would write yourself a ticket if you were a cop and you might have sped, oversped? Let's be honest, right? Most of us probably wouldn't, right? <laughs> but, but, but the reality is this is, but this, is, this is a level of integrity. And he says he didn't want to take an easy way out by avoiding the consequences because of the position of, his, the position of authority that he had. He wrote himself a $235 ticket, docked himself four points on his driving, driving record, and paid the fine. Most people would not have known about this, this man's deed, which actually happened in, in September 2006, but it only happened after he died, or, or, or after many years, after this, this occurred. And my point is that today, to follow Christ and to be an uncommon person is to live a life of integrity. So I ask you, when you are in a situation like Joseph, when there's a temptation and there's no one watching you, is the thought in your mind, how can I get away with this? Or am I, or am I going to walk away from this? 
Because if, if we're being honest, the flesh and according to the way the world leads us to think, we're taught to ask the question, how can I possibly get away with this action so nobody knows that I did this? Right? But to stand with integrity means I will stand for what is right at all cost. So number one, I said is uncommon love. Number two is uncommon integrity. And number three is an uncommon devotion. In Daniel chapter six, we all know the story of Daniel living in a foreign land. God, God gives him great favor in his life from the time that the Israelite people are taken captive from their homeland until the time of the end of his life. There were multiple rulers of the land. There was Babylon, uh, the Medes, the Persians, different groups. But throughout every ruler and throughout every uh, person that was in charge, Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they had favor with the Lord because they were highly uh, trusting to God. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, it says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, which is the document we know is, the, is this law that had been passed that people could only worship the king and not the God of Israel, he went to his house. So as the first action that Daniel does when he learns that he can no longer pray to his father God is go to his house where he has windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, gets on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And then these men came by agreement, found David, uh, Daniel making petition and, play, and plea before his God. I want to make a point about this, which is that, you know, like we know about this fact that Daniel prayed, it says here, three times a day. We know this because... It was pointed out here. But Daniel's practice of praying three times a day toward Jerusalem did not start when this happened. Daniel's practice of devoting his life to hearing and spending time with the Lord on a daily basis did not magically start on the day of this event. It didn't start with that. It started when he was young. It started when God put in him a spirit of excellence to serve the Lord and to seek after him continually. And this attitude that, that shaped him from the time he was young elevated him and gave him great status in a foreign land. But despite being in a foreign land, despite having all the perks of everything in that modern time, he said, I am going to keep my commitment to the Father. He had an uncommon devotion. It's funny, I, I think one of, uh, it, it's, there's, a, there's a thought today that, that uh, one of the um, features of the, of, the, of, the, of the generations nowadays is that there's a, there's a lack of willingness to commit to things. There's a lack of willingness to, to, to be devoted to something consistently. Rather, there's more of a temptation to be fleeting and, and, and to go to different things. And I would argue that in, in, in some way that is true. But Daniel knew who he was, and he did not let who the king of the land was, who the ruler of the land was at that time, he didn't let the laws of the land at that time determine or dictate his actions. What he said is, I'm going to pray three times a day. I'm, I'm, I was struck the, and, uh, by... This memory that I have, when, when I was in college, I had a roommate who was uh, not a Christian. He was like, he's actually of the Muslim faith. And something that really struck me was um, one day I was, I was having a conversation with him, and he was, uh, he was t telling me um, that he, he was like, hey, um, can you take a picture of me? Because he wanted me to take a picture of him and so he could send it back to his family because he's an international student. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take a picture of you. Let's, you. You want to go do it right now? Like, you know, we have a couple minutes right now. And he said, no, I, got, I have to go pray. And I was like, what? Like, right now? It's like two in the afternoon. Or like, what, like what, why right now? Like, what's the urgency that you have to pray like, right now? And he said, no, like, just give me like 10 minutes or whatever. And, so I, and I was observing, 
and um, just following in their in their traditional practice of in the Islamic uh, pattern, he you know did the in his um, room he had he had rolled out the rug and did and did the prayer and everything. And afterward, I was like, and afterward, I was um, I was struck because I said, man, what commitment, what devotion to pray to to honor the Lord. Um, and to, I mean, and to honor his God in his fashion. But he, wasn't, he was not about to let anything stop his devotion to serving his God. And I asked myself, here I am, a follower of Jesus Christ in a Christian country where no one is stopping me from praying any given moment. And yet I find it hard to pray. And it challenged me, and it made me, made me quite, it, made, it was a, one of those moments in life that really made me question my devotion. And so the point I want to make is, on this is there's, a, there's an uncommon devotion, an uncommon devotion to what, if you commit to spending time with the Lord on a daily basis, getting on your knees, seeking with the Father, abiding with the Father, if you commit to that and you prioritize that, that is honoring the Lord. How many hours do we spend binge watching on our various streaming platforms? And before we know it, two or three hours have passed. But then we want to spend five minutes in prayer and we can't even give that to the Lord. Right? How much, how much devotion do we have? There's an uncommon devotion. To be, to be a Christ follower, to be an uncommon person today requires devotion. And the last, the last thing is one of the things that really excites me the most. This is something that um, we have uh, been studying a lot recently. Um, and it has to do with the Holy Spirit and the giftings of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, one, verse 1 to 3, it says, um, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So my fourth point is, today is an uncommon pursuit. One of the things that I have studied or been paying attention to in recent times is that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts. We have these gifts of the Spirit that are available to us. And a friend of, myself, a friend of mine recently described it like this. It's kind of like God is sitting here and he has this um, container full of gifts, gifts of the Spirit that he's willing to give to you. And he, says, I, and he says, very specifically, earnestly desire these gifts. I mean, it's not a... When, the Word of God does not, does not uh, sp- explicitly state to ask for many things. I mean, there's not a lot of things it says. But it does explicitly say earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Very, it's not a casual suggestion. It's not a, you know, maybe you should do it. Maybe you should think about it if you get a, if you get a chance. No, it's earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And what's interesting is, so God has this container full of gifts. And one of those gifts might be speaking in tongues. And we especially in our, in our community, we, love, uh, we particularly value that gift, and we, we, all, we often talk about that gift, which is a good thing. But there's also many other gifts in this bag, in this container. And God is saying to the congregation here, he's saying, I want to give you these gifts. If you will ask me, I will give you this gift. You see, a gift is not just automatically given. A gift is, you, like, I, I don't deserve by my, my own merit some gift. I'm not gonna, uh, no one's going to hand it to me just because I'm, I'm special or because I'm good, but because I ask, because I earnestly seek after it. It says, what I love about this verse, he says, per, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And that's something interesting to me. So if I just took that phrase, pursue love, and said just that part, everyone would, everyone would agree with me that it is a biblical thing to pursue love, right? To pursue the love of God. Love other people. Show the love of Christ to people. Love. Love other people. Everyone would agree with that. But in the second part of that is earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And we treat that 
as a secondary thing. We treat that as an optional thing, right? So real, quick, real quickly moving forward, if you look at um, handling uh, the, but, but spiritual gifts have the kind of the characteristic of being spiritual, uh, like spiritual dynamite. We talk about the word uh, uh, dunamis, that the Holy Spirit is, is uh, ex- where we get today's word dynamite, explosive in its power, and there's an explosive love, explosive power of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like handling dyna- it's kind of like handling dynamite. It's strange. To an average person, receiving gifts of the Holy Spirit is a strange thing. Would you not agree? It's not, it's not easy to understand for everybody to understand what these gifts are. If you, I'm just going to list some of them. You know, we talk about exhortation or giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching, administration, apostle, discernment, faith, healings, help, knowledge, miracles, tongues, tongues interpretation, wisdom. These are all great things, but they can be kind of confusing. And it's dangerous. But the point that Paul is making, and I hope you capture this, is he's saying, I want you to embrace the danger. Embrace the uncertainty and ask for these gifts. And so this is where I want to land tonight is this. The body of Christ works efficiently when there is spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is in a constant pursuit of seeking the spiritual giftings of the Holy Spirit. If you are in a body for a long time and you never ask for a gift of the Holy Spirit to grow in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you get filled with the Holy Spirit one time and you speak in tongues one time and you hold on to that experience and say, oh, what a great memory that was. But you, but, and maybe that was five years ago, 10 years ago, but then now it's 10 years later, 20 years later, or however much, much time later, and you haven't asked for another gift of the Holy Spirit and you're not growing. And God wants to share a word in this congregation. Maybe he wants to use one of you to interpret tongues in this place. Maybe he wants to use someone over here to exhort, to encourage. You know, I was reading about Barnabas. Barnabas is one of the greatest encouragers there probably is in the Bible. Barnabas' actual name was not Barnabas. Barnabas' name was Joseph. Joseph. He was called Barnabas because he became such an encouragement to people. Paul became Paul because of Barnabas. Is there somebody in this church that could be a great encouragement to somebody else in this church? Could there be a Paul sitting in this room right now that needs encouragement because some other Barnabas needs to stand up? An uncommon life requires an uncommon pursuit of the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know this isn't talked about a lot now. We kind of shy away from this topic. We, we stay away from, because it's strange, it's unknown. But I want to challenge you tonight, and I want to, if I can ask the worship team to come forward and to, at least in a song, but I want to remind you of the four things. Number one is an uncommon love, an uncommon integrity, an uncommon devotion, and an uncommon pursuit. Are you willing to be uncommon? If I can have, I'll always close for a second. I I, want to ask just for a moment of personal surrender, surrender tonight. God is calling you to be uncommon in a generation of people, in a generation that needs to stand up for Christ. And I feel this this urge in my heart tonight to just land with this question. You heard these four things. There are more, there's there are several more traits, but I really wanted to hit, hit these four things. I want to ask you, how many of you are willing to be uncommon in your school? How many of you are, un- be, are willing to be uncommon in your workplace? How many of you are, be willing, are willing to be uncommon in your devotion to the Father? Tonight, I want to ask, as, as we go into this, this moment of, of, of worship, just for, just for a moment, I believe the Holy Spirit is asking us. 
It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christ follower. It could be many years. It could be a short time. But are you willing and are you able to be an uncommon force for God in the places that God has put you in? When it's not easy to stand up for Christ, when it's not easy to show up for something, because the, the cool thing to do is to not be there. When it's easier to be quiet and just let people say things that are offensive or hurtful, it's easier just to be quiet and just to, just to, just to avoid it and not to stand up for what is right. Who among us is willing to be uncommon? I want to, and I want to ask you, and especially in relation to the last, my last point about spiritual gifts, how many of you are willing to make a decision today to ask for spiritual gifts? To know that Paul's statement to the people of the people was not, hey, maybe, just maybe, if you get a chance, you should think about asking for a spiritual gift. He didn't say that. He said, pursue love. Pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. The more I was, as I was praying for this night, that was the burden on my heart because recently what has been just stirring in my heart is to see churches, to see bodies of Christ full of people that are activated with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that are standing up in their places, that are not just relying on the pastors and the worship leaders and the speakers, but they are standing up in the aisles and the pews and they are doing what God has called them to do. Is there a Barnabas in here? that needs to rise up? Is there someone who is, has a prophetic voice in this place that needs to rise up? Is there someone who has the gift of healing, the gift of helps, the gift of administration? Is there somebody here who needs to rise up in their gift and stop sitting back in the corner? You have no idea how much, how many of my, how much of my life I wanted to be the person in the back of the room with no mic in my hand, sitting and hiding. But when I recognized as a call on my life, I stepped into action. I want to challenge you tonight, as we sing tonight, in this uh, in this moment. If you're somebody who's willing to make a decision today to be uncommon, to, going back to the verse today, to present yourself, present yourself as a living sacrifice, to present yourself as approved, as one not ashamed. Consider that this night as we uh, sing this song. to the end of yourself do you think
a drink from the well Jesus is calling I talked today about a desire to be uncommon, to not be like everybody else around you, to not just fit in and meet the status quo. The the burden that the Spirit has really given me was that there would be a church activated in the gifts of the Spirit, a church activated to show extravagant love to show the agape love of the Father to others. And tonight, I, I want to issue a challenge before I close this tonight. We, we've heard the word tonight to have an uncommon love, an uncommon devotion, an uncommon pursuit of spiritual gifts. All eyes closed in this place. I want to ask you this question before I go before I close tonight. Is there anybody in this place that you want to make a commitment tonight? It's where you're which is where you're sitting. To choose today, starting this point from this point forward, to be uncommon, to not be like everybody else. To not just fit in but to stand up and operate the, and be the person that God has called you to be. Even if that requires some embarrassment, maybe. Even if it requires some rejection, maybe. But to stand up and say, this is who I am. If there's anybody here, all eyes closed for a minute, that is willing to make that statement to, today, to say, I want to be uncommon. I want to be uncommon. Would you raise your hand in this place? Secondly, I put this put out this request as well, this question as well. Is there anybody who is willing today? to heed the command or the directive of Paul, which is to earnestly desire spiritual giftings. As I say this, I want to remind you, we serve a loving, compassionate, giving, generous God that is willing to give us so much of his dunamis power and spirit in our life. But so many of us operate at this low level of faith, low level of, 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 uh, of our faith in our life. But when we are filled with the dunamis power of the Spirit, there is a, ooh, there is a manifestation. So I ask this question, again, all eyes closed, if there's anybody here in this room that is willing today, I don't, it doesn't matter to me how long you've been a Christ follower. Maybe it was decades ago. Maybe it was 20 years ago, however long it's been. Are you willing today from this point on to say, I'm going to ask and seek after more spiritual gifts and to fill the roles that need to be filled within this body, to be a Barnabas to somebody else, to raise up a Paul that needs to be raised up? If that is you tonight, can you raise your hand?
I'm going to pray over you and close tonight. Father God, I thank you for this night. I thank you for the scriptures and the word that you've given tonight. Father, I thank you for the people that raised their hands and said, Lord, that they want to be uncommon in this generation today. I thank you for the people that said, I want to start again seeking after spiritual giftings and operating in the gift and the power of the Spirit in this place in my life. God, I pray that this night is a start for someone to restart their walk with the Lord in a powerful way tonight. I thank you for the way, the Lord, that you've been ministering through this week, through the various uh, teachers and speakers. And I pray, oh God, that you would continue to minister as these days of fasting go on, as the end comes, as, the, as we approach the end of 2022. Let the Holy Spirit move in a mighty way. We thank you and we praise you for what you're going to do in this place and the lives of the people that surrender tonight and everyone under the sound of my voice. I just thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray.